Lord Malcolm Pearson Hello. from the UK. Uh, I have a few questions for you, if I may. First of all, in your speech yesterday, you had mentioned uh, some specifics to the threats that were leveled against you and against England as a whole uh, by certain persons uh, in the event that Geert Wilders was able to show his film Fitna in the House of Lords. Uh, some of that information was very new to me. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind terribly much, please, just repeating what the specifics of the threats were and who from. Well, um, we received, uh, we were told about the threats by Black Rod, who is the gentleman in charge of security in the Palace of Westminster. And um, he told uh, me that um, Lord Ahmed, who is the leading Muslim peer in, 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 in the United Kingdom, um, had threatened to put 10,000 Muslims on the streets of London if Geert Wilders came and showed his film, uh, had threatened to invade the Palace of Westminster, the House of Commons, the House of Lords, uh, and to disrupt the proceedings there, and to have me and Lady Cox, who was my sort of partner in crime in this exercise, arrested uh, for spreading religious hatred. I understand. Thank you. And I was wondering, uh, what, what do you feel is politically even possible in the UK at this time? What do you feel, in terms of the total set of solutions, what are, what's politically possible to actually do? Well, it's very difficult because the whole of our political class, um, our established parties, our political media, um, they are all extremely complacent about this um, uh, growing threat of Islamism. And therefore, I'm afraid the only way that we can begin to fight back is to make the people more aware, more widely aware, because the people who live in these uh, towns, which have already been taken over by Sharia law, where they are strangers in their own land, are, are, are people, um, they are already very angry. And you see that by the vote in the recent elections to the European Parliament, where the British National Party, which is a, a very far right, um, perhaps somewhat fascist organization, did extremely well. Uh, and they did extremely well because the people are beginning to get so angry. We have to um, contain that anger, we have to spread it, and we have to make sure that more people understand the threat which faces us from violent Islam. Uh, and, and you can see that immediately. If, if Gert Wilders had said, ban the Bible, uh, nobody would have reacted much. But because he said ban the Quran, he's lived under protection for four years, they're trying to kill him all day long, um, these people react, uh, and uniquely these people, only the Islamists react like this, no one else. Not, not, the, not the Hindus, not the Sikhs, not the Buddhists, and not the Jews, not the Christians, uh, not even the Irish Catholics. It is only the Islamists who behave like this. The evidence for that seems to be rather overwhelming. It Which leads me nicely into my next question. How do you feel about the EDL, or are there any other groups other than the BNP that might be a healthy channel for uh, appropriate outrage? Well, the EDL has immediately been um, uh, sort of associated by the political class with the BNP, they say it's all the same thing. And um, it is inevitable that, that people will react like this, as I say, uh, groups like EDL will, will come to the fore. And I am so desperate about the situation and I think that almost anyone who raises these issues and who brings them before the people you know, are welcome. But obviously we have to stay within the, the laws of our democracy. Uh, what are we going to do about these people? All we can do, I mean we can't throw them out, we, we can't send them home. We, we, there's, um, I'm talking about the jihadists now, I'm not talking about the majority of mild Muslims. Uh, that's another thing we've got to do. We've got to try and wake up the mild Muslim community to fight back against their violent co-religionists. They've got to say, look, this isn't what the Quran means. Um, they should take out a fatwa on, on, on their violent jihadists. They should do that. Um, but in the meantime, we can limit immigration. Uh, we can have controlled immigration. We can say you've got to speak our language. Um, we've got to make sure that the, 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 the imams, 80% of whom in our country can't speak English, must be able to speak English, we've got to know what they're up to. All those sort of things we, we can politically begin to fight back. Excellent. But we've got a long way to go because our political class is incredibly complacent, I'm afraid. Yesterday I also heard you speak about trying to reach out to other groups who have a, an, one would assume an immediate interest in joining this particular cause. 
uh, specifically gay and lesbian groups. Uh, I would think uh, feminist groups would be an excellent, yeah. or it, it, never mind feminist groups, but simply groups of women that feel that they yes. demand the right to maintain equality before the law. That's right. Uh, so there should be, one would assume that yes. in the, the natural alliances would be 80% of the non-Muslim population, if not 100. What do you think can be done to, uh, to help build bridges and, and establish, and, and build bridges between these different groups? Well, I, th I think we've got to agree that we, we can all work together. Um, I don't think that we're going to win this battle just with the, um, with the, with the Christian community. Um, we have to learn, the Christian community has to work with, as you say, gays and lesbians and humanists and, and people. And I think the area we've got to concentrate on our attack is on, on Sharia law, obviously, and its treatment of women and its treatment of gays and its treatment of her homosexuals. That's really where we can bring in um, the, the, the wider community um, to form a coalition to start standing up to this growing menace. Indeed, thank you. Tell me, uh, just a couple more, and they're short. Uh, how much time do you feel England has if nothing changes, if there's no, if, if things continue as they are now and no real fundamental policy change is enacted before all control of its cultural and legal destiny is lost. Well, it's hard to say, but of course, what is going to decide the answer to that is the birth rate. Um, the fact that the, the, the Muslims are breeding ten times faster than us. Um, the, um, I don't know at what point they, they, they reach um, such a number that we are no longer able to resist the rest of their demands. And I can't answer that question, but we must be looking somewhere between 10 and 20 years, something of that kind. But if we don't do something now, um, you know, within the next year or two, um, we have, in effect, lost. I, yeah, that's a terrifying prognosis. Uh, would you say, I just, out of curiosity, uh, if one was the darkest point of England's history as a recognizable nation in its however many centuries, millennia history. If one was the worst, bleakest moment for individual liberty and individual freedom, and ten was the was the the, the pinnacle of of British legal ideals and individualism and individual rights and a, the healthiest relationship between the state and the people, where would you say that the that England is now? Well, I'm afraid it's on about. Um somewhere between six and four, or on the way down. Uh, Lord Pearson, I cannot thank you enough for doing this interview. You've honored me greatly. Good luck, and thank, thank you very much.